I mean, it's okay, but it's, I'm just reading it right off the page. So I don't know why it's confusing, but okay. Um, only about 25% of the students have come to discuss their papers. So I'm afraid most of the students will not be ready to give the formal presentations and will not get a good grade. The research papers, therefore, will not be due until October 3rd, when you will give your formal presentations and be graded on them. However, you must do the reading attached for the September 28th class. Okay. You know, so Professor, you mean uh, our uh, formal presentation is uh, 3 October and uh, paper due is 3 October? Well, what does it say? Your research papers, therefore, will not be due until October 3rd, when you will give your formal presentations and be graded on them. Is that what it says? Uh, Professor, I didn't understand your point. Can you please make us more clear about this? Yes, like yes, when Professor. we have to give the presentation and when we have to submit our paper. Well, what does it say? Yes. Therefore, the research papers, therefore, will not be due until October 3rd. What does that mean? So we have to submit our, our paper today. So what October is third is last due, I think. Doesn't it say the research papers will be due October 3rd? So today we have to give the presentation. Well, what does it say? <laughs> <laughs> Professor, I am so confused. Emily. Why? Why? Okay. Why are you confused? The research papers, therefore, will not be due until October 3rd when you will give your formal presentations, right? On October 3rd, right? Yeah, that means presentation on October 3rd and we will also submit that on October 3rd. Right, isn't that yeah. what it says? Now it's clear, Professor. <laughs> okay, I just, you know, so I guess this is a lesson in, you know, you can imagine when I'm reading your papers, I get confused, right? But I don't understand why this is confusing, but um, I don't know. Okay. I don't know how else I could have said it. They'll be due October 3rd when you will give your formal presentations. Okay. I don't, I just don't know how else to say it. I, okay, whatever. But anyway, is that clear? October 3rd, papers in, presentations. Yes, um, now it's clear. <laughs> okay. And then you had to do the reading for today, right? Is that clear? Yes. However, you must do, okay, very good. All right. So um, let's see. So let's look at the reading. Hopefully you came with a few comments. Um, but let me start out with an example, just to give you an idea of what a Marxist feminist would think. Um, so for next time, actually, why don't I do it this way? Okay, here's the syllabus. And I've changed the readings a little bit but it shouldn't be confusing. <laughs> it should be right there, I think, right? That October 3rd students present their papers, right? I don't think that's too confusing. Um, then on October 5th, I, I, I will have some attachments, women in the workplace. And then there's an, uh, an article a student wrote about how the product that are bought by women are overpriced, okay? And why are they overpriced? It's, this is a Marxist thing that everything has to do with money. So students bring their own examples um, of how their bodies and their emotions are exploited in order to make money. And they're also exploited 
because women need these products in order to sell their bodies and marry a guy with money. So if you think from a Marxist point of view, if a woman wants to get rich, if having money is your social identity, then if having money is what gives you value in your society, that's success. For most women, marrying a rich man is the way she'll get rich, much more likely than if she tries to work and, and make a lot of money. So if a woman is calculating how to make the most money, she would marry a rich guy or marry a guy whose goal is to be rich and she would do whatever he said. Well, so in order to attract a rich guy, what does she have to do? Well, in a lot of your countries, she has to use skin bleaching products. So she has lighter skin because then she'll be more desirable. She has to, well, in my country, it's, she has to get breast implants. She has to get liposuction. She has to get facelifts. She has to get hair care. She has to get makeup. She has to get, right? So that's literally her job in order to make a lot of money. She has to attract the male gaze. <laughs> and so those products are um, overpriced, way overpriced, because, the, because women will still buy them, because this is their job to make their bodies attractive. Okay, so that's a Marxist analysis that women are made into products, commodities to sell to the richest guy, and then they're successful. And that's how the society defines people and values people in a capitalist society. That's a Marxist analysis of capitalism. So for next time, uh, you can bring your own examples. Um, I had a student in um, one of my other classes, actually, I, I think I could send the paper, but it was an environmental ethics class, and it was about these skin whitening products. And from her point of view, she was looking at the carbon footprint of the whole process of creating these products. Plus, it ruins women's health. Um, there's a lot of evidence that the stuff in the, in the creams uh, leaches into their bodies and um, disrupts right their bodies. So it, so it does harm to their health. But also there's all the carbon footprint of getting the, the ingredients and shipping it all around and putting it in some plastic bottle. And um, so anyway, that was, that was looking at the same skincare product from the point of view of the environment. Now, in this class, you can look at the same product from the point of view of a Marxist analysis of capitalism, which is that a woman's job she, to spend as much as you have to spend to make your body beautiful in a way that a rich guy or somebody who's going to get rich would be attracted to you and then you can be successful. So um, for next time, uh, you can, I'd like you to um, think of examples, but that's sort of the main theme for today is the Marxist analysis of capitalism and then his idea of what to do about it. And then in particular, how does that play out for women? Um, all right. And then I, so I, the schedule here is what's posted on the syllabus for in today's syllabus because I changed it a little bit. Not a lot, but I did change the dates for a lot of things. Um, you don't really even have to look at this because I'll put it on the stream. But if some of you are looking at it, then I, I, I wanted to tell you that I did change it. Um, so let's go to this. 
And again, I hope you brought your own ideas of what you'd like to talk about in the groups. But if not, I want you to think about this. The Marxist analysis of capitalism is that capitalism reduces people to commodities. They're like extensions of the machine. Everybody's looked at in terms of their economic value. Everybody's reduced to a, a laborer, <laughs> a wage laborer, and a very few people at the top own and run everything. Um, so, so the Marxist analysis in general is that people are social, right? It's within this social context that people develop their consciousness. So the ultimate cause of human oppression is economics. And then a Marxist feminist would say that that's the cause of women's oppression. It's their place in the economic system. So for example, in Marxist analysis of men's place, right? We have the global North and the global South. And capitalism <coughs> is necessarily exploitative. It exploits labor. So Northerners, um, multinational corporations, they will go anywhere in the world to get the absolutely cheapest labor, which it's cheap because there's uh, because the country is less developed, so they don't have laws about minimum wages, and the workers are more desperate, so they'll work for any salary. So someone like Ivanka Trump, she set up a shoe factory in Ethiopia because that was the absolutely lowest wage in the world. So that's what capitalism does. It exploits people. Um, and so for a, a feminist Marxist would be, well, okay, so you have colonies. Capitalism creates colonies. So there are the owners who stay in the developed countries and have a nice, you know, developed society, but then they, they farm out their work to the colonies, right? They make the colon, people in the colonies do the dirty work or else they, they bring, them, bring them home as slaves or um, they right now they don't bring them back as slaves. They just employ them in these huge networks, shipping, transportation networks. They can, the workers can stay located in their, in their homes but they're underpaid and they're exploited as much as possible to get the maximum amount of work out of them, which they will agree to do, right? Um, so that's the way capitalism works. And so Marx's claim is that the proletariat class is going to become aware of itself as exploited and there's going to be this huge revolution and they're going to take over. They're just going to have this class war. <laughs> of course that didn't happen, but that doesn't mean the critique of capitalism is bad. The critique of capitalism is really important. And just because Marx didn't have a good solution doesn't mean he didn't go do a good job of identifying the problem. So even within our country, the US, we have colonies because the, the US Northern countries, uh, states have made the Southern states into a colony. So the Northern states have unionized labor a lot more, a lot higher percent, and the Southern states have less. And the Southern states is where the, most of the military come from, right? The boots on the ground. So the people in the North tend to be the, um, the military people that are the officers. They go to officer's training school. 
And then the ones in the south are the ones that actually face the danger. And that's a colony, right? And so a feminist would also say that women are colonized because they are made to do the work that men won't do. Like a lot of them go get the water, wash the clothes, collect the firewood for cooking. So they are given the, the dirt work. And not only that, but they're given the housework and the childcare and they're not paid for it, okay? And so it all goes under this wonderful rubric of, well, you do it for love and there's more and more to life than just money. But um, if love is important, then money also matters. And when women are expected to do all this labor for free, they can never be economically depend independent. And as long as they are economically dependent, they are treated unequally. You can't treat someone as an equal if they depend on you economically. It, you, can, you can delude yourself into that, but Marx will say, as long as there is this huge disparity economically, it's not equal. And the, the owner, or in this case, the husband, the breadwinner, which is the husband, has absolute power because the worker has to do what they say. Or, I mean, hopefully the, the owners or the employers aren't too nasty, but they could be. And the workers or the women can't do anything about it because a worker has to have their job to survive. And most women have to stay in the household to survive. So that's the way, that's the feminist take on Marxism. Um, all right, I'll go through a couple of more points and then I'll stop and see if you have questions. Um, his view of human nature is that we basically are born blank we can get molded anyway, according to the, our experiences. Then he says the number one thing that molds people is survival. And each society has a certain kind of economic system, a certain system that exists in order to meet the basic needs, survival needs. And the nature of that system is how people get molded. And then each person's place within that system completely molds their consciousness, like their idea of themselves, their idea of anything, God, freedom, equality. Um, and all of their concepts are basically a function, the result of their place in their type of economic system. And so, for example, uh, Marx called religion, he was a flaming atheist, but that's because he called religion the opiate of the people. What he claimed was um, the word God <laughs> was used by powerful people to control powerless people. And so they would use religion. They would claim, well, there's some higher power there that loves you and cares for you. And if you're a good little boy and girl on, in this world and you do what your employer tells you and you don't drink too much and you don't fight too much and you don't get obese, but you're a good little worker, then you go to heaven. <laughs> but there's this heaven. And so when workers are exploited, Marx said, whenever you find religion in a society, you know you have oppression because people don't just live a complete life on earth. They're oppressed. So then they have to imagine this complete life after death. 
that's alien. It's a sign that their humanity, that they've been dehumanized by the economic system. So when when people say he was an atheist, he didn't mean, you know, he was a nasty guy. It just meant he was a severe critic of religion. I don't think of religion that way, but it's very compelling, right? Politicians do use religion to manipulate people economically. They hide behind religion and to get rich and powerful. And then they just tell people, well, just you know, pray to God and you'll go to heaven and don't worry about it. But anyway, so, so his concept of human nature is we're completely molded by economics and survival. And that is a collective activity. It's not nobody survives economically in a vacuum. They all have a place within this very, very big system and it determines their consciousness. So the, the idea, the way that women's work is never done, the way that women are expected to do all this work day in and day out for less money than men or no money at all is a social construct and it's designed to maintain oppression and also women's self-image. Women feel like, I mean, if you have to do dirty work all day, you feel like you're not as good as a guy, right? I mean, the whole system is designed for you to accept your oppression. Um, and so as long as that's all you can do and that's all you can think about, yeah, I mean, it, it seems like that's true. And I remember, you know, for decades, almost 20 years, I did a lot of housework for free and I felt rotten, right? I really thought I was stupid. So I understand how it can happen to somebody. My ex-husband thought he was smarter than me. My in-laws thought they were smarter than me. I had to take care of little kids and I was thinking of stuff that I I, I remember thinking I could have done this in ninth grade. Most of what I think about, I could think that way in ninth grade. And after, you know, decades of that, 15 years of that, you really do think, I guess I'm stupid. I really did think I was stupid. And um, it wasn't until my third child had an IQ test and they all were super smart that I got really angry and said, who told me I was stupid? How is it I got made to feel that way? So, um, so you can notice that. I want you to give examples for next time. Do you see examples of women who are expected to do this low status work, low pay work outside the home, or they just do all this very menial labor at home for no money? And they start believing, you know, that that is their place, right? Um, I, you know, it's 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 really interesting to to read students' papers because it's clear that it's not as pervasive as it was. A lot of you have mothers that are ambitious for you because they know, you know, <laughs> that they don't that they want you to have something better because they know you have a natural capacity that's better, that's higher than uh, work housework. And the other problem with that is when housework isn't paid for, then people don't respect it. And so then the whole children really need caregivers. It's a very important job, but as long as it doesn't get paid, it doesn't get any respect. And so the Marxists say, you need to pay women for housework and then people will recognize that it actually is important for somebody to be there for a kid. Um, and then the people that question that, um, there's, you know, feminists really disagree with each other on every point, but 
but I didn't make you read all the disagreements. It's just that you don't have to accept these things. They disagree with each other. But um, the, the counter argument to that is if you pay women for housework, they won't seek outside employment. And so they will get stuck in these, you know, just pretty menial jobs. Um, okay, so that's that. And then, so capitalism isn't just, okay, here's the next point. That liberal, uh, liberalism, the way it's come down, is this free market. It's maximizing individual freedom is the liberal ideal, right? So I have freedom. I have a right, right? All those United Nations rights. I have a right to uh, my body and I have a right to get a job. You remember those capabilities? I have a right to this and a right to that. And if you look back at the capabilities model, it said, you know, um, capability of surviving bodily integrity, education, leisure time, participation in political life, practical reason, set up an idea of the good and be able to have opportunities to achieve it, um, education, healthcare, all that stuff. So um, Karl Marx says that capitalism, uh, liberalism says that the government, um, I make a contract with the government and the government protects me from other people that want to harm me, but then I'm free to do whatever I want and to think of any way I want to try and make a living. So according to liberalism, I have a contract, right? I run a company and I write a contract for workers and the workers can freely come and decide if they wanna work for me. They're free, they're not slaves. I'm not making them do this job, but here's the contract. And if you sign the contract, then you're free and equal, okay? Like you can go start a company and you can hire your own people, okay? So everybody's free and equal. But Karl Marx says, wait a sec, somebody has enough money to own a company and then they hire workers and they keep them at the minimal level possible for them to survive, to, to stay healthy enough and safe enough to get back to work. <laughs> so they won't give them any more than they need to. I mean, if you have a job where they have to know how to read, then maybe a capitalist will, you know, pay a little bit for some public schooling so they can read. So he doesn't have to pay for it after they get the job, but no more than what the workers absolutely have to do to make money for the owner. Well, how, how is that worker gonna be able to have enough money to start his own company, right? <laughs> but it's said that it's free and equal. Okay, so Karl Marx says, this is not just a system of exchange relationships where I give you a contract and you can decide if you wanna sign it, right? Transactional. We have a transaction. This system is a system of power relationships and it exploits people. It doesn't develop people. It doesn't provide opportunities for people to develop their capabilities. It's basically a power relationship. Um, people in the system talk about freedom and equality, equality like everybody's equally able to go start a factory and write contracts and everybody's free to do that. No government is making them do it or preventing them from doing it. But I mean, the way the system's set up, some people are gonna be rich and some are gonna be desperate and they're not free and equal. Um, 
let's see. So the relationships exploit people. Um, it's not voluntary. So, you know, the employer will say, but you actually voluntarily signed the contract. So you were free. Well, if you didn't sign it, you starved to death, right? Plus, the owners of companies used to talk to other owners and say, well, how much are you paying them per hour? And, and none of those owners would go above a certain amount. So if the owner said, well, you can go find another job that pays better, there is no other job that pays better. So there was, um, it, was it was bad, right? It's not free and equal, but it, it was called that. So that's the way a bunch of words can cover up what's really going on. Um, ah, the other point is that the workers make a product, right? Let's just say they make, um, well, they make that skin lotion, that dyeing, whitening skin lotion for women, right? And so the workers go on the factory line and make it and they crank it out and they, it costs maybe a dollar for all the supplies and the workers' salaries. And it, they sell it for like $20. So they have a huge profit. So, and then the owner goes and uses that profit to, to make another industry or to build another factory. Well, so what that means is the, the energy that the worker put into the product, they don't get back. The workers do not get back the value of the product that they created. The owner exploits them and takes the profit, takes more, takes some for himself that he didn't work for, that they worked for. So, um, so that's another way that it exploits people. But, and this is, I want you all to think about this in terms of the way the capitalist system works now and you coming from the point of view of a developing country. So Karl Marx thought that the workers all over the world would develop this awareness that they're being exploited and there would be a whole international revolution. But that isn't what's happened. Instead, many of the workers want those products, right? They completely sell out. They believe all the advertisements, right? So a worker might save a whole lot of money to be able to buy this whitening lotion <laughs> that's expensive, right? Because they want to be the same, right? They want to be part of this capitalist system. So, so you can think about whether you think capitalism has brainwashed the people in your country. But that again, that's exploitation. That's the exploitation of the workers. It's the exploitation of the colonized that they bought into a fake value system, right? A, a value system, economic system that exploits them. Um, so, um, so Marx thought that capitalism would eventually destroy itself, and that isn't what happened. Um, okay. Now, let me just stop there for a second and see if anybody has comments or questions. Has anybody ever, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. I was asking about to briefly uh, tell about the connection between like Marx uh, theory and feminism, the relation between them. Okay, good. Again? Okay, I actually didn't talk about that a lot, and that's a good thing. Uh, it's a good point. So there's a difference between um, socialism, democratic socialism, and communism. All right. Um, democratic socialism is that you have uh, uh, 
citizen engagement in society, you have free speech, uh, free artistic expression, freedom of scientific inquiry, freedom of, um, uh, you have a capitalist free market system, but you have taxing, you have a uh, quite a bit, you know, 50% plus taxing to redistribute the wealth so that everybody has decent housing, decent health care, decent um, education. That's democratic socialism, okay? Then there is socialism, socialism, which is that there is no free market, that the government runs everything. So the government sells you your clothes, your food, your housing, your cars, your um, everything. Like nobody can make their own money on anything. And apparently in China, I, I visited China a couple of times and they were telling me what it was like. Like somebody tried to have a vegetable garden in their backyard so they could eat their own vegetables. Uh-uh. <laughs> it was that, you know, obsessive that you could not make any product like vegetables <laughs> that, you know, you would eat yourself or you would even sell or give to your neighbor because that's interfering with the market, which is owned by the government. Uh, they're not like that now, but that would be absolute 100% socialism. No country has that, no country, except maybe North Korea. Communism is capital C, communism is a certain political party that was run by Marx and Engels that had a certain historical presence and uh, triggered a number of revolutions. Um, and that there are people today who define themselves as communist, capital C. Um, and that would be just a certain political party with a certain history. Now, the communists in various countries at this point have different policy recommendations. You know, they vary in how they behave. But that was that's capital C. Now, small C communism is that when the government completely controls the economy, people will go. The, the, the society he envisioned was that everybody could go fishing in the morning, spend some time with their kids, read a book, paint a a uh, picture, everybody is gets their basic needs met and then they're free. They can do artistic work. They can do scientific inquiry work. They can read whatever they want. They can talk to whoever they want because they're not desperate for money and they're not oppressed. That would be small C communism. Everybody works together. Does that answer your question, Rahima? Yes, ma'am. I I was asking to relate the uh, the like feminism and uh, Marxism that you uh, that the uh... okay. So from a woman's point of view, if um, if uh, the government is running everything, then men and women. He says the family unit is an economic unit. It exists because um, it's the, the form that the family takes right now, the form of a dominating male and the female who does the dirty work, the colony <laughs> and the kids. Why is it, how did that form of the family come about? Because the source of economic wealth is outside of the home. So the man leaves home and he makes the money. So he has to make sure that his, bio, his children that, that his wife has are his biological children. So that's when uh, female monogamy became really important. And any kind of promiscuity 
right? You get stoned to death for adultery, right? It was super severe because he has to know when she's pregnant, that's his kid. So that's when monogamy, women's monogamy, doesn't matter for men, but it, it's an economic reason for that double standard. And then, um, then the money is passed down from father to son. So that's when men dominated, was when the source of wealth went outside the home and he wanted to make sure to pass on his wealth to his biological children. Um, before that, the source of wealth was in the, in the house, in the weaving and the reproducing and the gardening and all that stuff. And then women were the center. And there was um, men moved into their wives' houses and the women were in control. And then probably also women governed, right? But as soon as the wealth moved out, the form of the family changed. So what he's saying is that in a small C communist society, when nobody's driven by money, people can have free sex, right? They just have sex with whoever they want. It's not an economic thing. And then you have a couple kids and make sure they get raised, but your kids don't inherit your money. Um, and you just have, his vision was that your relationships are way higher quality because there's, they have nothing to do with money. And so nothing to do with possessing another person or controlling another person. Um, does that at least make sense in some theoretical way? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I mean, I lived at a time, right, years ago, when this seemed a lot more feasible. But what's obviously happened is capitalism has completely taken over. And the developing countries, for the most part, they bought into it, I think. But I really want to hear from my students. I want them to tell me, do you think people in developing countries really do want to be just like, you know, Donald Trump or something like that. Do they really aspire to being rich and having the house and the car and all that stuff? Um, and that would be that they got brainwashed. Um, Roshani? Um, yes, Professor. Uh, when you were discussing about this Marxist feminism, capitalism and everything, I uh, wanted to share a few things. Um, and uh, even in the readings about, you know, uh, Bugali, what is that? Uh, that society. Um, uh, and in one book uh, regarding Engels, uh, when she said that private in regarding private properties and everything, women uh, women in Brogue's families like they were very humiliated and had to listen to the masters and give birth to the son only so that they can uh, you know hand uh, hand over the property the parental property then child to their uh, son child only. So this was uh, something very like not appropriate, right? And in even in uh, our places uh, like in our in our country, um, we have this uh, fight uh, for um, giving equal proper, um, property rights to son and daughter. And not just that, uh, women or daughters are not able to get citizenships uh, in the name of, uh, like in the name of their mother, like a single mother or the mother who are divorced, who are left by their husband are not uh, able to give citizenship to their child. and. Uh, in every, even in the schools uh, where you go, like they ask uh, who is your parents or who is your father's as a main uh, guardian. They don't regard uh, women as, uh, you know, senior, uh, as a guardian or the proper parents who can deal or talk with the people. So, uh, so. I also agree that if uh, the Marx, I also agree with the Marxist feminism where, you know, uh, where they can, uh, they can uh, accommodate or they can include all the people uh, and uh, all the women and give equality. And uh, regarding uh, um, the classism or the cap communism, maybe, um, uh, yeah, even in our places, women are um, 
women are humiliated or let's say they are uh, discriminated in terms of class and caste as well like uh, rich girl uh, poor or high class high caste low caste you know we have this caste maybe it's not in the western but we have this caste system uh, as seen to the classes so these things are like um, very uh, it feels very bad but uh, if the feminist is if, if this feminist movement like if the awareness regarding this feminist movement uh, like goes on rapidly then maybe there could be some change and i feel like the movement that ingles and calls to can lenin uh, they, they 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 made it uh, like if we have something like that then that could maybe create an impact uh, to the women's as well you know and the one point that touched me is that it's women's body it's women's right right but why do we have to pay if we are giving a birth or if we are you know if, if what if women are very poor and if they go to hospitals and so on so on it's the necessity that birth is a natural process so why there is something like a money or all those things right. in that as well so that is very um right everything turns, <laughs> like right. That no, no. everything turns into money like a yeah. kid, a kid is a commodity. And yeah, um, so next time, actually, I want you to just brainstorm and think of all the ways you just put on your little um, dollar bill, in my case, glasses, but put on your little glasses with your uh, form of, of money in, you know, and see how much of what we value or what, you know, the way things are structured it all has to do with money. Um, so here's another concept. The concept is alienation and um, alienated labor. What that means is I go to work I, and I can ask you, this is asking college students about this is a good thing. Um, have you ever worked in a factory? Have you ever worked at a crappy job? Um, so I, I really don't know about the AUW students, but in the, in the US in order to pay for school, a lot of time in the summer, the students do these crappy jobs. And so that would be alienated labor. That would be where you're pouring all your energy into this product, but you don't identify with the product, right? Your life becomes meaningless because you're pouring your humanity into things that are meaningless to you. So they're alienated from the product. They don't care. They don't want to buy this product. They're alienated from themselves because they don't take any pride in their work because they're just a person on a, an assembly line. Like you can't say, boy, I really cut the feet off of pigs in this really special way. It's such a craft, you know, it's like, forget it you know it's just it's a job so people don't take pride in their work um they're alienated from other people like they're set up to compete against the person next to them in order to get the promotion right they're pitted against each other and then they're alienated from nature like they go away from the natural world they're stuck in these factories they and in addition, of course, the jobs are often dangerous and they're, they breathe in terrible fumes or whatever, but it's just an extremely unnatural environment. So they're alienated. So the concept of alienated labor, it's dehumanizing. You're, you, it just leeches your humanity right out of you. So um, one of the reasons why I try to... Um, get you to study the different goddesses and think about which one or which ones really mean something to you is because you want a job that's meaningful to you. Um, it will take a lot of your humanity, right? It's going to be hard work for decades. Um, but if it's something you like, like I got a job, right? I can't believe I get paid to do this stuff. Like who would want to do anything else? and find out about women's lives around the world. I mean, I get paid to do this. It's amazing. But um, I want every student to find out something where when they get, you know, in their 30s, 
and they have a job, they go, wow, I cannot believe I get paid to do this because this is something I really want somebody to do and I get to be the one to do it, you know? So, um, but within capitalism, most jobs are not like that. And most jobs will leech the humanity right out of you. Um, but another, if you have a job you love, you're not materialistic. Like you can donate money, you be a philanthropist, you can donate your time, you can be a mentor. There's just all these other ways that you can contribute because you have a job that doesn't leech your humanity, right? It doesn't suck you dry. Um, all right. And so women, in addition, in addition to working a meaningless job, women come home and or men come home from their meaningless jobs and then they want women to serve them, right? They want to feel a sense of dignity. Like, so, but they, their wives then have to be the one that serves them, right? They get the product of her labor, just like his employer gets the product of his labor. He wants to be the boss somewhere. So that's at home. Um, and then, so women lose their sense of self. They're dependent on the family and friends' approval. They're dependent on people approving of their children because they're the ones that, you know, if the children turn out well or don't turn out well, that's their responsibility because that was their labor. So their children, whether they turn out well, is that's the product of their labor. So they're responsible for it, even though, my God, it isn't their fault. There's so much other stuff that goes on, but they get blamed. Um, and then the other thing that I want, um, I wanted to point out about alienated labor is that relates to what I was saying before about the liposuction and the breast plant is that women are alienated from their own bodies, right? So they work on their bodies, but they're doing it for the male gaze. They're not doing it for themselves. And then the next problem is that women will argue against other women, right? A woman will say, you're being brainwashed, right? Don't put that stuff on your skin. It's going to make you unhealthy. It's expensive. And it, and it tells you that you're not good enough the way you are, right? It takes away all of your joy in being alive and tells you you've completely got to change yourself so some guy will approve of you, right? So you're trying to tell this, this woman, and she's, no, I'm doing it for my own sake. I like light skin and I like, you know, and then they have these huge fights. And, like, but that's the way oppression works is that the person on top tries to get the people on the bottom to beat up on each other and to blame each other and to uh, dehumanize each other, call each other brainwashed or whatever. So that's another kind of alienation. That's, again, it's all related to money. Um, all right. So then the next thing was um, that in politics, as long as you have an exploitative system, the legal system, the political system is all controlled by the people in, in charge economically, okay? And then, um, yeah. So under capitalism, you are a wife and mother. You are a um, factory worker you are a factory owner. I mean, it's like, actually in real life, we all are human beings and we have common humanity, but under capitalism, we aren't, we're fixated. We are whatever we do to make money. And so then he says, under small C communism, like I said, nobody, everybody engages in a whole lot of activities and everybody is just being a human being, right? And they're getting along with each other. They're curious about stuff. They're creative. 
um, whatever. <laughs> and then this, I talked about this in terms of how you went from a woman's society to a men's society. Um, it was economics. Um, and so Marxist feminists um, say that you have to, women have to go back into the workforce and um, housework and child rearing have to be considered jobs. And um, let's see, all right. I think that's probably enough. See if there's anything else. Um, okay. So uh, I do want you to get into groups. Oh, free love. This was <laughs> free love as the communists understand it. Um, so they said that in the old days, in the bourgeoisie days, um, a bourgeois woman had to be monogamous and she had to stay home because he had to make sure all of the children she gave birth to were his kids. But he could go out and have affairs with anybody he wanted to. So that was like a brothel, right? A bourgeoisie brothel. It's all based on money. And so the prostitutes that he would use they're they're in it for the money too and they're letting themselves get exploited and um he the guy the owner takes advantage right he can use some women to be his prostitute he has this other woman to be his producer of his heirs to pass his money down to and you know women are just his servants in many different ways because they totally depend on him for their survival. Um, but once we have communism, everyone can have sex with whoever they want and it'll be joy and strength. And <laughs> so there are stories that women used to get together and talk about stuff. And uh, Lenin used to get fed up with them because they kept talking about uh, stuff that Lenin wants to focus on the guys having their political power struggles and the women were just kind of talking about I don't know babies or um, I don't know love affairs or something it was kind of funny the lack of interest in politics um, but as soon as we get women equal and out there in the workforce then they'll be uh, much better at understanding politics um, okay, so, so I would like to get you just being able to talk to each other a little bit instead of just me talking. And um, I don't really care what you bring up, but just like Roshani, you know, was bringing that up, I think it'd be great if you just talk to each other about um, to what extent is everything that goes on women's self-concept, the way they're treated, to what extent is that all about money? And do people in developing countries resent this exploitation of capitalism or have they really bought into it and they want the same things that capitalists tell you you should want and that capitalists want, right? Um, and, and uh, especially when it's obvious that capitalism is destroying the natural environment and people in developing countries are you know, having these uh, natural catastrophes more and more um, frequently, are they still buying out to capitalism? Do they still aspire to being rich on a fossil fuel economy? Are they questioning the whole thing? or not, you know? And then the next thing is about women. Are women questioning? Um, but I mean, it's obvious that why do parents uh, marry off their daughters at age seven, eight, nine, 12, whatever? Money, right? And why is it that a girl child is such an economic burden and a boy child is not like that? Who constructed that, right? That's a social construct 
based on the economic system. And it really does cause a lot of women to suffer a lot, but a lot of them accept that, right? Their self-concept has been, you know, brainwashed into believing that this is the way, th- okay, there's not, they're not in a revolutionary state of consciousness. So it, I hope that's enough. Is that enough for you guys to talk about? I hope so. Um, let me put you in some breakout groups and somebody takes charge, make sure everybody talks. And then I would like to come back together, someone be the spokesperson and just briefly summarize what you said, because it is fun to collectively, if, every, if everybody has an insight, then by the time we're done explaining them all, it's the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts. And then people can get even more ideas because everything's connected to everything. So, okay, let me put you in groups here. Um, Um, all right, so the spokesperson should give about one minute summary of what you came up with. Who's group number one? It was our group. Go ahead, Marzia. Uh, okay, a professor in our group, uh, we discussed about the, the problems and that women are facing and the belief on women's the belief that the society have uh, on women, like why, uh, like in most of developing countries, women are defined as to give care, take care of children, take care of family, and take care of the house. <laughs> but uh, we say that uh, we discussed that uh, the reason behind, there is two major reasons behind the situation. First, the lack of education for women, and the second, financially problems. Uh, uh, the lack of education is uh, like if women are not educated, so uh, they are. If the women are not educated, they will not know about their rights. They will accept the society's explanation about their rights because they have no idea that what she what she has as uh, human beings. What she what is her rights, uh, and also for the financially problem uh, is. Also, because women are not given opportunities to study, women are not given the opportunities to work, so they are uh, dependent financially until they are like until they are in their father's home. They are dependent on their fathers, and after they marry, they are dependent on their husbands. So uh, these all are the reasons that cause many problems. And also, we have talked about the early marriage and child marriage in Bangladesh. That uh, uh, that uh, we have discussed. That what is the reason? The reason is that most of families are poor, and also uh, in rural areas they are not educated. So they prefer to educate uh, their boys uh, more than their. Uh, they prefer to educate their boys, and instead they force their girls who are you know, not in a legal uh, age of marriage. They force her to marry, and. This is an opportunity for the parents to, uh, like, uh, to, uh, how can I say, to feel, I mean, that uh, this is the responsibility for for parents to feed their children. So when they force their daughter to marry, this is a way that they are, they they lead their, or uh, I mean, that, how can I say, this is a responsibility. So, after that, they will not have the responsibility of feeding. Okay, good. It always, it goes back to money. And so if women aren't allowed to exercise their capabilities, right? 
then they don't know what their rights are. So there's a direct correlation between your capabilities and your rights, right? So if you never are given an opportunity to use your brain, you don't think you have one. And so you don't think you have a right to education, right? That's, that's kind of the, the thing. Um, yeah, so let, yeah. I also one thing is that uh, why women are having all this problem is that uh, one of the reasons is that they are not given opportunity. Right. Yeah. To develop their capabilities, right? Yes, of course. And then they know they have them. And then they sort of want to keep exercising them. And then they go and find out, gee, the legal system doesn't allow it. And then they'll start to change things, right? Um, yeah. So they, they have to get this, they have to be able to use what they have before they even know they have it, right? Yeah, so that's, that's the thing. Okay, what about the second group? Yes, Professor, we were uh, into the discussion and it was like similar to the one that group one said. We were uh, initially, we were also talking that what factors um, make uh, pulls women to be economically or strong or so that. And it was something like uh, the women are busy in the household work due to the patriarchal systems. So we are not, women are not supposed to work out and they are just, uh, you know, have to rear children, look after them, look after the family's responsibilities and all. So in compared to that, men get more chance to explore themselves and more chance to work. And despite all those works, household works and all the responsibilities, women, uh, if women goes out of the house and work, they still get the less wages and uh, they want to get much motivated uh, right so when we look at the business cyclones of the businessmen around the world we find uh, uh, like women's names like very less and that that what makes us feel something bad we discussed about that and the other thing we discussed is that uh, the your uh, point that um, the other the one way of making a women rich or something like that is to marry a rich guy with all of us related in from our society. I guess we, uh, some of us related from our perspective. And if something, some relations uh, of uh, the males comes to our family, then what factors we look first is how much he earns or what is his earning source, right? And even, um, and for girls, they first they look at, first thing that they want is if she is beautiful or not. If she is from the uh, good family. The family is aside. Like if she is from the good family or not, that is uh, th that comes at the last point, I guess, because uh, because men uh, for the, if the, a man has to marry a girl, they look if she is beautiful or not. Then comes if she has uh, she is polite or not. If she is well behaved or not. If she can take the responsibility of a family or not, physically fit or not. And then comes if she is intellectual. If she is if she is with a, uh, like high class and low class, that comes at the later on. But for men, class is the first. So that we discussed and uh, that's what we were discussing, Professor. Yeah, well, you know, class wouldn't necessarily be important because then she'd be totally dependent on him economically, right? <laughs> so yeah. Yes, Professor. <laughs> okay, so exactly. here's, here's another thing that that uh, capitalism teaches you to think of your body in ways that are completely unnatural because they make money on it. So as a matter of fact, I envy all of you, your skin, because you have better skin than I have. White skin is lousy skin, <laughs> okay? I mean, you get, it is, it's more frail. You get these age spots are really ugly, but I also had a cancerous little thing on my arm because I spent my summers in Greece. So we get cancer easier. I mean, it's it it's lousy. Like you don't want white skin, you know? And but they sell it but, to you, right? They sell it to you and they make tons of money and they make you ruin your body just so you can have white skin. That's just awful. It's so disgusting. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. You're supposed yeah, to have, exactly. you're supposed to have big breasts. Well, you don't need big breasts to nurse babies. I was very good at feeding my babies <laughs> flat chested. And then you're supposed to, you know, what you really need are big hips. But 
big hips are out, right? And it's just, if you really think about it, the system sells you a body that is not natural, but that costs money to aspire to that. It's all about money, you guys. So here's one other thing, though. I just want to point out that when we meet next time, you give your presentation and I have these criteria here and they're at the first, the first day of the class. Oh my God. It's the first day of the class. You, um, you can scroll all the way down and it has these criteria for the, the speaking that you're organized, that you deliver it, you know, you project, you answer questions, you know your, your stuff and you have a central message. So those are standard criteria. I don't think it's too complicated, but that's what we'll do. We'll just listen to each other the whole time, you know, presenting your papers. And, you know, I think it's, don't be scared. It's just everybody should be eager to find out what each other said, ask questions. Um, I don't like to dominate, but I do get excited and I'll start asking questions if other people don't but I'll, I'll try not to ask the first question, all right? So um, take care and I'm excited about next time. And I can stay later here if you want to talk to me about your papers. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Professor, have okay, a good professor, day. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye. Oh, Marzia? Uh, yes, Professor, I have a question. I want to know that can we have an opportunity to talk to you before submitting our paper about our paper? Well, you're supposed to, right? <laughs> <laughs>